free. Mr. Bejeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, I would suggest to you that instead you may want to provide the kids with some kind of structure, right? Whether it's in your will, whether it's because you've created a revocable or irrevocable trust and put some rules in, right, to provide that structure, some kind of structure. At the least, when you've got three kids, you want a mechanism that says, if there's a disagreement, it's majority rule, right? Or if there's a disagreement, here's who has to figure out the disagreement. Here's the arbitrator who's going to get appointed, right? Some way of allowing the kids to figure this out. You want to figure that out. The second, now, at least you have to do that. The second thing which you really should do, which is a very close second to that, is to figure out this financial issue. What happens when one of the kids can't afford to pay their share, right? What happens? Or one of the kids just says, I'm on the West Coast. I'm never coming back. I loved the campground, but I'm never coming back. I want to sell out my share. Except who can afford to buy out the one-third share? You know, can the other two kids afford to buy it out? Develop a mechanism that deals with that. A common one, just to give you an example, is to say, if, you, if one of your goals is to keep the campground in the family, is to say, okay, if one of the kids wants to sell out, that's, wants to get bought out, that's fine, except what we do then is we, fig, we have an appraisal, we, or we figure out a price, and we all agree ahead of time how that works, and maybe typically you just use whatever the town of Oak Bluff says the cottage is worth, because otherwise you can be arguing about price for a long time, right? You apply a discount to that, and you say, by virtue of wanting to leave this and not enjoy the cottage, right? You are entitled to something, but it isn't what your share, what it isn't, in this case, if there were three kids, one third of the value of the cottage. It's some percentage of that, right? And then, and then give your remaining children a way to pay for that without having to go get a mortgage right away, right? Say those, that the payments to that child have to be over five years or over 10 years. So there's some device that allows the kids that, that, that want to stay to be able to buy out. Now, that is just an example of the kinds of issues that you may want to deal with. But the very, at the very least, avoid this issue where everybody has a veto. And where if one of the kids says, the roof really, I'm sorry that the roof is leaking, but we can't afford to do a repair, that all of a sudden, you know, nothing happens. Or that child is not responsible for any of those repairs. So deal with that issue. Uh, or at least, in your will, put in the nuclear option. The nuclear option, which I know, I know some folks here who have done that. Uh, the nuclear option, well, if the kids can't figure out a structure for dealing with this within so many months of the day that I die, the property is going to get sold and the proceeds are going to get divided, right? So try to get that figured out, out early on. Just try to get, do your kids a favor. Do your grandchildren a favor. These places are so wonderful. Give them a relatively simple way to deal with those issues. Finally, working with the Campground Association. So I remember when I first did this presentation a few years ago, and Craig Lowe introduced me, and, he was the, and, 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 and I was talking about all these issues, and almost immediately the questions that came up were, well, how does that work as far as our lease is concerned? And I realized I hadn't looked at that at all. <laughs> and obviously, that's a very important question for all of you folks. And I had, I had heard that there were some, you know, some discussions about that this summer, about kind of what the rules are going to be. So, a couple of comments on, the, on leases and on the rules. First of all, as a legal matter, um, the campground association, as a result of the special legislation that created the campground, really has, what I will say is, as close as there can be to infinite discretion regarding what the rules should be. Um, that's first. Second, in the use of that discretion, though, um, the, the, it would appear that the Campground Association does not have to require any particular form of ownership as a, as a prerequisite for your being able to, to have a lease in the campground. So the Campground Association really has pretty much infinite flexibility on all of this stuff, right? Third, 
I read the, 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 the transfer section of the, the, the current regulations, right? And the way I read those regulations, every one of the options that I have presented today regarding um, having Frank and Mary structure things for estate tax issues or nursing home issues can all be done currently um, with the current lease structure, right? There is, a, there, there is a, a whole list of people who end up having to sign on to that lease as a result of the, the, uh, what structure you're using. If it's a limited liability company, it has to be the managers, it has to be the owners of any interest. If it's a trust, it has to be all the trustees, it has to be all the beneficiaries. If it's a corporation, there, there is an incredibly expansive list of the number of people that have to sign on, right? And that's really in the discretion of the camp meeting association. But I guess what I'm suggesting is that given that, all of the structures that I've talked about to try to help you deal with all of the issues that I've talked about can be done in the context of, it looks to me like in the context of the current lease. So um, whether you love them or whether you hate them, I think the campground association um, folks, right, um, can deal with any of these issues. And I think, it seems like, have made a real effort to try to give people the flexibility to do this stuff by allowing limited liability companies and trusts and all of these things. Um, but I think that you can, you can do any of these things. Um, who should be on the lease? Once again, I just read the section from the, uh, the rules of the campground meeting association. It just sounds like the easiest answer is everybody. Uh, everybody who is a beneficiary, a trustee, has any interest in a corporate, has any interest, uh, needs to be on the lease under the current rules. But of course, the camp meeting association, because of the flexibility they have, could change any of this um, at any time. Um, this is my client's basic goal, is to sleep well at night. And hopefully, this has helped you think about some issues that may help you sleep better at night. Or if it has gotten you a little bit nervous about some issues, convince you that when you go back home, Maybe you want to talk to somebody, you want to talk to your lawyer, your accountant, and try to figure some of these issues out. Uh, a short ad, if you live in Massachusetts, um, Frank and Mary are sponsoring a team in the Alzheimer's Association annual walk, which is this year in September, on, on Sunday, September 28th. We'd love to have you join. If you want to look at this website, which is the Frank and Mary um, uh, blog site, um, and participate with us, we'd love to do this. Many of the problems I'm trying to solve are problems that are going to get solved once there is a way to slow down the rate of dementia um, for folks who have Alzheimer's and other things that cause dementia. I really don't care if I'm going to get, my mother died in a nursing home at 81. Um, my older brother just got an early diagnosis, he's 78. Uh, I don't care if, I'm, if I have dementia as long as I get it when I'm 105. You know, so if, to the extent that we can find ways to be doing that, I think we, we, we're all going to benefit. Uh, and finally, if you want to see this presentation again, or if you found this of interest, or there's anyone in the campground that you think might, might want to see this, we're going to upload this to my YouTube channel, so you can just see it on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the first uh, uh, part of your uh, presentation, you mentioned the, the federal capital gains tax at 23.8 percent. Uh, could you just, uh, I understood that all along here it's been 15 percent, and I know that uh, our president has, uh, and others have added uh, additions, but that difference between 23.8 percent and, and 15 percent, what, what does that represent? That's a lot. Yes, it is. Uh, I, I took those numbers from an attorney named Alan Falk, who's one of the attorneys in our office who does nothing but tax work who told me that's the rate now, that the, that the combined federal, that, that, that the federal rate, including the, the, uh, the so-called Obamacare, Medicare edition, uh, um, is that. That the, that, the, that the magic number, which we all have in our minds at 15%, jumped to 20 across the board. And then there was the, Ob the, the Obama extra of the three point, I think it's 3.8%. So it's 23.8%. That's, so that's where you start. That's your federal capital gains rate. I, I'm sorry, did I hear that? I thought that the, for higher income people, the capital gains rate went to 20, and then that three is the, is the Medicare supplement for higher income. So I think that's what makes up the two. Uh, well, in fact, I, yeah, I was speaking from, say, one of the lower income people, and I was talking 15%, and I didn't think there was anything beyond the 15%. 
What I understand is for higher income people, it's 20 percent, and then the additional three percent. And I've forgotten now where the where the cutoff is between high. But I know I'm low. So you're saying your understanding is that it's still at 15 percent until you get to a certain income level, yes. right? Yes. And then, and then you also, if you're at that higher level, you also get the, the, the joy of paying an additional amount to uh, yeah, Obama. If you get to that higher level, you're also going to have to pay yep. some of that other stuff. Yep. I, just make the I just make the observation to you, though, right? And once again, I, was just, I gave this as an example to our tax guy who does nothing but this, right? And he gave me these number, numbers back. I would make the observation that if you're Frank and Mary and you just, you just, you just had a, uh, a capital gain of $250,000, then I don't know what your current income is, but that's probably going to push you over those magic numbers, right? Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the summer. It was uh, really a pleasure, and maybe we'll see you here back here next year. Thank you all. Thank you.